Shalom, shalom in one of our rare live um, conversations here in Scottsdale, Arizona. We have a, um, an important topic today with a, an important scholar to discuss some, some fascinating insights. We want to also thank our friend Jake Bennett from IAC Action for his partnership in, uh, in making this happen today. Let me tell you a little bit about Aaron Lipkin, who's here with me today. Archaeology and Bible scholar, Aaron Lipkin is an educator and filmmaker from Israel who specializes in Joshua's altar and the Gilgal footprint structures of the Jordan River Valley and Samaria region of Israel. Aaron is a member of the Manasseh Hill Country Survey archaeological team founded by the late Professor Adam Zertal of Haifa University. Mr. Lipkin was involved in the groundbreaking 2021 discovery at Joshua's altar of the Mount Ebal inscription, the oldest known surviving Hebrew text. Dated to the year 3300 BCE, it was found inside a lead tablet unearthed at the site. Mr. Lipkin's film work focuses on bringing together archaeology and the geography of Israel with biblical texts and narratives. He's the founder and CEO of Lipkin Tours, an agency dedicated to educating visitors on the biblical heritage of Israel. He lectures for academic institutions, policymakers, churches and synagogues, and via TV and radio. Aaron is also involved in interfaith dialogue between Jews and Christians, serves as a liaison between pastors and rabbis, and is a spokesperson for his hometown of Ofra. Born and raised in Yerushalayim in Jerusalem, married to Esther and father to five children. Aaron, thanks for taking time to talk. Thank you for having me. Good, very good. <laughs> so um, to start, I, we, I want to discuss these archaeological findings um, that look at the veracity of Sefer Yoshua, Sefer Shoftim, the book of Joshua, the book of, of Judges. But before we do that, maybe you could share a little bit about the general academic view of the historicity of the t specific time period of the conquests of the Israelites. Okay, I think that uh, archaeologically, when you look at the uh, history of archaeology, what you see is that in the late 19th century and early 20th century onto, like, say, the 50s, um, most archaeologists are either uh, Christian archaeologists that fully believe in the historicity of the Bible and are coming to the land of Israel to investigate what they think or where they think the historical events happened. Uh, you also have uh, the early Zionist Jewish archaeologists that see the archaeology as a tool to strengthen the, the connection between the Jewish people and the new state that was just born in the land of Israel. So uh, during that time, everybody believes in the full historicity of what is described in the Bible. Later on in the 1960s and 70s, you have this critical uh, theory that comes from Europe and basically takes over the world of archaeology. Uh, where until where when you get to the 80s or the 90s, the, the general view is that the Bible is not historical, that the Exodus never happened, that Joshua and Moses never existed, that the book of Genesis is does just a compilation of, of uh, mythologies from Babylon and Assyria that the Israelites adopted. And so when I go to, to school as a high school kid in Jerusalem to a secular school, I've been, I'm being taught by, by, by my Bible teacher that these stories never happen because that's the mainstream academic view. The reason is there is no evidence. We didn't find anything in the temples of Egypt that talk about the 10 plagues or the Israelites being there. We didn't find any uh, uh, proof for the Israelites roaming the, the, the Sinai for 40 years. And there's no, event, no evidence for the conquest of Canaan. So it's not that they had proof against it, it's that they didn't have enough supporting evidence to say that was that was a, a fair claim. There is a lack of evidence, and right. therefore it didn't happen. That's the, the theory. Right. Great, great. Now, as I shared, you're um, a member of the Manasseh Hill Country Survey archaeological team founded by the late Professor Adam Zertal of Haifa University. Can you share a little bit about Professor Zertal and kind of his evolution and thinking? Yes. Um, Adam Zertal was born and raised in a kibbutz. Uh, he was an atheist, he was a socialist, a, a leftist, yeah. and um, when after the seven, 1973 war, uh, the Yom Kippur war, he was wounded in his leg, and he decided to go and become an archaeologist. About that time, uh, Israel started uh, doing something that no, was never done before, and that is to make an archaeological emergency survey, archaeological survey of Judea and Samaria. Keep in mind that Judea and Samaria were under Jordanian control for 19 years between 1948 and 1967. After the Six Day War, the area opened for archaeological research, which enabled archaeologists to, to, to research the area. Adam Zertal and his crew received a certain specific geographical region, the Jordan Valley and the Menasseh uh, tri tribal land. And what they basically did was to walk systematically and document every ancient site that they found. 
And this was never done ever in the history of archaeology. And the results from that survey were astounding. We're just, just going to talk about the specific time that we are talking about, and that is the time of, of supposedly Joshua, the Israelites, the conquest. And what they found is one, an, an, an unexplainable influx of settlements during the early Iron Age period. We're talking about the year 1300, 1400 BCE. From, from a desert of no settlements, suddenly you have an influx of settlements. They found mysterious footprint structures that Adam Zertal, uh, in his research, believes they were the, the Gilgal, the ancient worshiping sites of the Israelites. But the most important finding is while surveying the slopes of Har Eval, Mount Ebal, yeah. uh, Adam Zertal finds an Israelite altar, a, a humongous, the biggest barbecue stand you ever saw in your life. Yeah, so flesh this out first. What, what was exactly was found there and wh why is it so important? Well, Adam Zertal, first of all, is, is, is looking, is, is serving without any preconceptions. Right. He's not looking for Joshua's altar. He's not looking for Gilgal. Yeah. He's not looking for any of these biblical sites. Mm -hmm. And, and, and suddenly when he, he understands that that pile of stone that he sees on the slopes after excavating it, finding bones that are all of kosher animals, finding plaster, finding uh, Egyptian jewelry, scarabs that dated to, to, to the year 1400, these, all these findings let him understand that he actually found Joshua's altar. And, and that moment in his life, he describes in his book, A Nation Born, he suddenly understands, he says, he says to a, a friend there, he says, you understand what this means? This means that Joshua existed, and it means that Moses existed, and it means that the Exodus happened. This, this understanding that this specific site connects the five books of Moses on one side, and then Joshua and the early prophets on the other. It proves both mm -hmm. sides. Mm -hmm. and, and so this, this discovery was indeed a, a groundbreaking discovery in biblical archaeology. Mm -hmm. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, it didn't go through for different reasons. And, you know, we can discuss that yeah. maybe in a different program. But uh, we're very happy that uh, we just found an amazing discovery just recently, two years ago. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. So just the last question on that. So what are the implications of that? Like, if people understand this, what are some of the moral or religious or political kind of underpinnings and implications for this? Well, I, I think that, uh, that everything that's connected to Israel yeah. is political, right. uh, unfortunately. Right. And, and everything that's connected to Judea and Samaria, also known as, known as the West Bank, or some call it the occupied territories, depending on their political right. view, right. Um, everything that's connected to that area is even more sensitive. Yeah. Uh, and so I think that, that finding an Israelite site mm -hmm. at the heart of Samaria or the West Bank, near the city of Shechem or Nablus, um, has definitely has political repercussions because it shows the strong connection yeah. of the Israelites or the Jewish people yeah. to that the heart, the biblical heartland of Israel, yeah. and it's definitely a problem. And that's that's a big obstacle in the archaeological research because many Israeli archaeologists that are researching that region cannot receive grants from international funds because it's political. Yeah. They cannot advance the, mm. the, the, the archeological research because they don't have money to do it. Mm. Um, the final report of the excavation of the, the altar from the 1980s yeah. wasn't yet, hasn't yet been published because yeah. they were not able to receive grants. Mm. Thank God it's going to be published soon. They, they're just working on the final report and uh, parallel to the discovery of the inscription that we're going yeah. to talk about, um, the, the, the final report on the excavation of Joshua's altar is also going to be published in the next few months. Wow. Sorry, I lied. One last question because yeah. it's so interesting. <laughs> and Harival, did, obviously this confirmed what we knew from the Torah, but did it add anything we didn't know from the Torah? Was there any insight that we learned um, that hadn't been recorded in the Torah. Yes, indeed. So first of all, we, we have to just say one sentence. Mount Ibal is the, the site or the location of one of the most important biblical events described in the Bible, parallel to Mount Sinai. The whole nation of Israel is, is convening at Mount Ibal, the mountain of curse in Mount Gerizim, and they are, they are answering amen to all the curses and blessings that the Levites uh, utter. This is a, a receiving of the Torah the second time in the land of Israel, this time. Um, and so when Adam Zertal this, this, this finds this altar that is spoken about in the Torah, 
Um, he, he actually, and that's actually the, the great thing is that the archaeology yeah. even, even that doesn't just prove, but it also sheds new light on the understanding of the Torah. And so first of all, you see that, that the altar was not used just for one day, a one day ceremony. It was actually a Bama or a temple, a place of central worship for the Israelites for 70 years. After they finished using it, they decommissioned it by doing a Geniza. They, mm -hmm. they covered it with stone. And then archeologically, you see that the, the site in Shiloh, in Shiloh, where the tabernacle was right. later on, started uh, uh, operating. So you actually have this, this new, in, new information. The site was used for 70 years. Yeah. Um, and uh, and the, there's so much more to yeah, talk about, yeah. obviously, but that's just so, one example. So, so theologically, why do you think, why do you think Har Sinai happens outside of Israel? So here we're talking about a sort of a, 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 you know, as we're approaching Shavuot in just a week, we're thinking about divine revelation. Why, why, so we have this dimension of Harival within Israel. Why do you think this other experience of Sinai happens outside? Wow, that's a big question. And I have a many, many theories about yeah. it. Uh, but we know that it says in the, in the Tanakh, God, it says, Betzetcha miseir betzadecha mizdeedom. God is described, and when I'm saying God, I'm saying the, the name of Hashem. The, the, the name of Hashem, that, that, that revelation of God comes, uh, comes from Sinai. It comes from the area of south, southern uh, Israel, um, uh, fairly in Jordan, Saudi Arabia. That area is the area where Hashem comes from. That's, that's how the Tanakh uh, calls it. And when you ask archaeologists, they will tell you that that that. Hashem, that, that 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 appearance, is 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 an appearance that is that is um, not local. It's not Canaanite. It's it's from outside of Israel. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, theologically, I personally believe that that, that the desert is the place mm -hmm. for the revelation. It's mm -hmm. the place where the Israelites are being disconnected from the the bondage in Egypt, from the from the slavery, becoming a free people, at least. Minded, mindedly becoming free and, and are able to receive the Torah mm -hmm. willingly. Um, but we, again, we have to, when I talk about Mount Ibal and Mount Sinai, yeah. Mount Sinai, our sources, our Jewish sources say that Hashem kafa alehem har mm -hmm. They didn't have a choice. Right. They had so much fireworks and miracles going on. They had to say to God, yes, mm -hmm. we'll take the Torah. Mm -hmm. Mount Ibal and Canaan, is receiving the Torah willingly mm -hmm. in the land of Israel. No fireworks. We want to do what yeah, you told us yeah, to do. Yeah. And that's the big the big uh, yes. meaning of this event. Yes. Wishing you continued success in all Thank your work. You. And friends, want to let you know we're going to share pictures because it'll bring to life this phenomenon when we can show you some of the pictures of the foundings of Har Ibal. Oh, yes. Yes, let's let's conclude on that, the sharing this tablet <laughs> that was found. Thank you. So um, we did a, a, a special... Uh, um, extraction operation just recently yeah. uh, we took the archaeological dump of professor adams Rital and re-examined it yeah. by doing a technique called wet sifting and we found a really small tablet yeah. this big yeah. uh, wow. that uh, after researching it uh, we found 46 letters on one side and 44 letters on the other total of 94 yeah. ancient hebrew letters with a, a curse a terrible curse and uh, the interesting thing is that that has great implications on the academic world. The Israelites are literate. They, can, they could have written and read the Torah. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the Israelite religion uh, of, of worshiping Hashem, yud Hey vav Hey, yeah. was in effect during that time mm -hmm. parallel to the worship of El. So when it says uh, Hashem Elohim or Elohim Hashem, on that tablet, that's that has great implications. So, the, so the earliest, the earliest Tanakh we have, what you and I discussed earlier, roughly twenty, uh, roughly six six hundred BC, right? Right. But this is thirty three hundred years ago, thirteen hundred BC. This is this is six hundred seven hundred years prior. Prior to that, it's to not that Tanakh, but it's it's it's. Well, how would you describe it? It's a curse. I mean, it's it's Hebrew letters. Well, that that's the interpretation. We yeah. don't know uh, what is the context of this curse. Is yeah. this is, yeah. a, is this a personal curse of someone against the other, or right. is this part of the ceremony ah. of blessings and curses that's mm. described in mm. the book mm. of Deuteronomy, mm. chapter twenty-seven? Ah, okay. uh, I personally believe that it is part of that ceremony. Yeah. The word Aru, 
appears wow. 12 times, wow. just like it appears 12 times wow. in the Torah, yeah. in the book of Deuteronomy. So I think that that's a pretty strong case for, for that. It's not a coincidence. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but, but who knows, the, the final report is going to be published soon, and it's probably the most important archaeological discovery yeah. that was ever made in the land of Israel. Wow, beautiful. Thank you so much. Shabbat shalom.